Hi, this is Jose Luis, and welcome to another video on the, on the Introduction to Parametric Modeling series, where I'm going to talk about what data structures are inside of Grasshopper. Okay? If you remember from the previous video, I did an example where we were trying to model something, but the result of the modeling was not exactly what we wanted. So make sure you check that video to understand the context of where we are on this one. And before I figure out the solution to that, I wanted to run some definitions about how data is handled inside of Grasshopper. Okay. So before I actually start into go before I actually go into the definitions, let's take a look at this very quick example. I have in my Rhino, I have created a surface that I am going to be using for some kind of design purpose. And I did take that surface and brought it inside of Grasshopper. So now I can use it here. I have, a, I have it as input data. And I have also uh, dropped a couple of sliders that are integers. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to subdivide this surface into a family of points in the U directions and in the V direction of the surface, very similar to how we did it in the previous exercise, the Berlin Holocaust Memorial. So the way I'm going to do that is with this component that we already are familiar with, which is inside of surface, I'm going to divide the surface into a grid of UV points. So I'm going to place this component, I'm going to plug in the surface, and then I'm going to plug in how many divisions in the U direction and how many divisions in the V direction do I want. And you can see that um, you can see that I now have like five points in the V direction, and I have three points in the U direction. Remember that this correspond to divisions, not the amount of points. So if we divide the surface in two segments, we will get three points. And if we divide this surface into four segments, we will get five points in that direction. Okay. All right, so this is great. But then what I would like us to take a closer look now is into what is coming out of the point output of the component. And for that, I'm going to plug in a panel. And I'm going to plug into this panel here. And then I'm going to extend this a little bigger. And in previous exercises, we had seen how the outputs of some components are not just the data itself. But for some reason, this uh, component is has some kind of like subdivision into three sections. And each one of the sections has like five elements inside of it. And then there's this weird thing here that is like zeros and zeros and ones and subdivided with semicolons, which is kind of strange. We hadn't really ever taken a close look at what that means, which is what we're going to do right now. So the way data is handled in Grasshopper is by using a very, very specific data structure that is particular to Grasshopper in, 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 in particular, sorry, uh, which is called data trees. Okay. Some other systems or other parametric modeling environments have other ways of handling data. So most of the stuff that I'm going to explain today is going to be particular to Grasshopper, but also many of the ideas that I'm going to explain are also generalizable to us all their environments. So what are data trees? Data trees are um, complex data structures where the information of the, the information that is contained in the structure is subdivided in a tree like manner. What that means is that the data is just not simply all there to be up for grabs, but it has some kind of hierarchy and some kind of structure to it. So the idea behind that is that in particular, what we're seeing right now on this panel is that this panel contains roughly 15 elements, which correspond to the 15 points that we have here, but they are subdivided into categories. And what is each one of those categories? Well, it turns out that the main components of a data tree are the branches. So what gives data trees a hierarchy, as if imagine the data tree, like blooming out into multiple branches. So data in a data tree is typically grouped under branches and branches are like different 
branches, I don't really know what other word to use here, are different branches of, are different groupings of how the data can be structured in this overall tree, okay? So what we can see, for example, is that um, if we have 15 points on our surface, we can see that there are, it, that the tree is subdivided into three branches, each one of them containing five elements, which is kind of makes sense given the fact that we have three subdivisions in the three points, three families of points in the U direction, and then each one of them containing five points in the V direction. So that kind of makes sense. So for some reason, this component decides to, instead of just giving you the 15 points right away, it decides to group them into three groups of five elements, which is kind of nice for the reasons that we will see very soon. But we will, before we go any farther, let's take a look at something else that is part of the branches. If you look, branches are basically indicated in panels by using this gray separator between them, and we can see how each one of them contains the elements. But at the same time, we can see that is, there is some kind of numerical indicator here that corresponds to the branch itself. So what is that? Well, it turns out that branches have what's called paths. And path is basically a way of indicating a, a unique identifier that can differentiate that path from any other path. The idea is that if we had a very complex data tree, and for some reason we just wanted to retrieve or cherry pick one of the branches, we could use the path, which refers to as the, which is basically the name of that branch. We could use that path to fetch or to retrieve only that branch and therefore only the elements inside of that branch. But also, or, um, but you also may wonder like, oh, but why we do have like three different numbers and like why are the first ones always zeros and only the last one changes? Well, that is related to the data tree metaphor and the idea that, um, that a data tree is actually the result of like several chain operations, each one of these, each one, each one of which may actually be branching, branching, branching out the data into more and different branches. So what this means in a very metaphorical way is that the data that we have is coming from two first processes, two processes that maintain the data under the same branch. And then in the third process, in the third level, that's when the data branch it out into three different branches. That is kind of what this path with three different levels and with the first two levels being zero for all the branches and the last level being different from each branch, that's kind of what it means, okay? Uh, this is a very simple process, so that's why this tree is very simple, but when you get more complex and when you have done a lot of operations sequentially over a data set, then data trees can get much more complicated and much more rich, if you will. Um, a way of looking at that data structure is by using the parameter viewer, which if I plug in here and I double click, you can see that I can kind of see that metaphor represented with this tiny tree. First operation is common, second operation was common to all the data, and in the third operation, the data branched out. Okay? Um, all righty. And so these were paths. Now, another thing to remember, sorry, is that path IDs are unique. So there cannot be two branches on the same tree sharing the same branch name. If that was the case, and if we actually share, if we actually joined two trees that had branches with the same name, the elements in the branches with the same name will combine into a branch with that name that would have the elements for the two branches, okay? So um, branch names are unique. 
What it's not guaranteed is that branch names have to be sequential. If you do data manipulation, you can kind of eliminate this data, this branch here, and then we may have a branch that starts 000, and then the next one is 002. And we might be combined with another branch that is just the zero, or the another branch that has five or six levels on the same data tree. So data trees and branches don't need to be homogeneous in their structure, and they, their names don't need to be sequential. That can vary. Okay. Last, not well, not not even last, not even close to last. So every branch in my data tree has a lot of different elements. So this branch has five elements, this branch has five elements, and this branch has five elements. The elements are the actual data that the tree is containing. And because they are separated in branches, each branch has a collection of data. In this case, the data is three-dimensional points in the space, in the rhino space or in the grasshopper space. So each one of the elements that is contained in a branch is typically referred to as elements, or in the case of grasshopper, you will very often find the word item to refer to each one of the elements on a branch. So items, whenever you see the word item in grasshopper, it basically means a single element inside of a data tree. Okay? That element can be a number, can be a string, can be a point, can be a vector, can be a surface, whatever. But an item is one single element, which is part of a full data tree. Okay? Now, another property that is very important, this is extremely, extremely important, is that you can notice how elements inside of a particular branch, they are ordered. There is a sequence to how they are ordered inside of the branch. This is the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, and the fifth one. And you can also notice that in front of the elements, there is this number that is indicating the position of each one of these items inside of its branch. This number is extremely, extremely important, and that number is typically referred to as the index number. And that index number, index, is the word that is used in Grasshopper, but it's also a word that is very, very commonly used in computer science in general, to refer to the number that indicates the position of an element inside of a collection of elements. All right? Indices are super, super important because they give us a way of pinpointing to a particular element inside of a collection. So very often we will want to retrieve just the first element of a collection, the second element of a collection, the third element, etc., etc. All right? Now, I want you, and this is super important as well, I want you to realize how very particularly, and this might come across as a little weird if you don't have programming experience, but it turns out that the first element of uh, the, the branches inside of Grasshopper is not element number one. It's actually element number zero. And the last element from a collection of five is not element in position five, it's element in position four, due to the fact that we started counting with the index number zero. So in Grasshopper, and in most programming languages that I know of, the index number for collections or lists of elements always, always, always starts with zero. And this is 100% true in Grasshopper, and it's also the case in pretty much any programming language that I can think of. So we always start counting elements with the number zero. And this can be a little confusing at first. We need to keep that in mind. Um, but um, it doesn't really take that much time to get used to it. And also, the last element of a list of n items will have the index number n minus 1. So if it's 10 elements, the last element will be element number 9, for example. Okay? Index numbers inside of a branch, as opposed to branches, index numbers always, always, always have to start zero at zero and are always, always, always correlative. 
I cannot have, I cannot start with zero, then go do two, then do seven. No, no, it always has to be zero, one, two, three, four, blah, 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 until we run out of elements. Okay, super important, 100% accurate. All right. And then the last thing that I would like to talk about is that, oh, sorry, no, I forgot. I, that was the wrong, <laughs> that was the wrong key. And the last thing that I would like to talk about is the fact that inside of branches, what we actually have is these elements that are typically referred to as lists. So wait, what are you talking about? Yes, well, turns out that technically speaking, a branch is the whole package of all the elements with their index numbers and the path name for that branch. However, what is included inside of the branch, just the data, is typically referred to as a list, okay? So, and I want to highlight this very importantly because, um, because sometimes out there in forums and in um, people informally talking, blah, 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 whatever, sometimes people tend to refer to as a data list as all the elements that are present inside of a data tree. But strictly speaking, that is not true. Whenever we talk about lists, and very specially in Grasshopper, what we mean is each one of the collections that is inside of a, of a branch of data. So for example, this data tree has three lists inside of it. Each one of them wrapped inside of a branch that has a path and with a bunch of elements that have correlative indices starting at the number zero, okay? So the full data tree has 15 items here, but also contains three lists, each one of them containing five items. Okay. All right. So this was super important. Data trees, branches inside of data trees, the paths that define, that are the unique names that define the branch, then the items as each one of the data points that is inside of the branch, the indices, which which are the numbers that indicate the position inside of the list, and then lists as the collection of data that is inside of each one of the branches. Not the whole thing, just each one inside of each one of the branches. All right? If this wasn't clear, um, please take a look uh, at the video again. All right? And um, I also, before I move on, I will very, very likely want to recommend this video by Andrew Human, The Deal with Data Trees. It's a 20 minute video where he explains, um, he explains the um, many of the topics that I just explained uh, and, and makes the definitions and it, he explains how data trees work. It's a really, really good video. So um, if you have the time, please make sure to check it out. Okay. Now, all right. So these are the definitions and these are the names that we're going to be using from here on to refer to the elements inside of a data tree in Grasshopper. But blah, 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 blah. What can we do with this? Why is this any useful at all? Well, let me actually bring a couple examples of how we can manipulate and how we can change the structure of these data trees to our advantage. And we're going to be doing that in the next video, which is going to be data tree operations in Grasshopper. So stay tuned for that one. See you on the next video. And if you're liking what you're seeing so far, maybe consider liking this video, subscribing to the channel, uh, turning on notifications, etc., etc., and all those YouTube things. Thanks a lot. This was Jose Luis. See you on the next video. And let's take a look at operations that we can do on data trees. Bye bye.